Did you enjoy your lunch? Good. We're going to continue where we left off. And there were some like really good questions raised in the last five minutes of the of the uh, presentation we had before lunch. And you know, I was so glad that Hardy didn't answer those questions because <laughs> he would totally ruin my presentation. So this was good. So what we're going to look at now uh, in the next um, hour or so is the emergence of social movements. And uh, I will give a, like a brief introduction into that. I will see what are the different, I will try to, how shall I say, present what are the different stages of movement formation. And then Maciej is going to uh, go deeper into explaining the actual mechanisms of why people join movements, why people start movements, and how, what are the, like, let's say, specific mechanisms, how this is happened. So in this particular presentation, we're going to clear some things up. You know, we're going to, you know, answer a couple of questions that were raised. Uh, you know, what's a movement? What is a, an organization? What's a coalition? What's the difference between these? You know, in, the, in terms of tactics, what is a protest, you know, in relation to the movement? What is a revolution? And all the questions that were raised. Do you know, uh, by the way, how the term revolution became a political term? So revolution means the rotation of planets around the sun. So it's, a, it's not a political term at all. And so how did it become a political term? Well, when encyclopedists in France in the, in the 18th century were thinking of reforming the old order of the French monarchy, they were saying what we need to have in politics is what uh, they had in astronomy, that, you know, that revolution of the planets. You know, that, that means the disturbance of the old beliefs and the old ways. And, uh, totally turning it upside down. So a term from astronomy entered uh, politics. It's actually a very interesting side note. So we're going to talk about all these terms and try to put them in perspective. So first, the first moment of movement emergence, even before any kind of thinking about the movement uh, happens, is the process where people turn their hardship into grievances. So let's imagine a house on the top of the mountain, OK? There's nothing around. There's no roads. There's no infrastructure. And let's say th this house doesn't have electricity, doesn't have running water. The guy who lives in the house has to go every morning down the hill to the stream to fetch water and come back. OK, so I guess we can agree that this person lives a very hard life, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but he doesn't have any grievances. But let's imagine the same house in the same conditions in the middle of the city. The guy doesn't have running water in his house, doesn't have access to electricity, and everybody around him has that. So he lives the same hard life, but what is the difference this time? He has grievances. He says, why, I don't have, why is it that I don't have running water and I don't have electricity in my house when everybody else has it? So the same hardship can sometimes produce grievances and sometimes will not produce grievances. The main question here is, is, it, is our hardship something that you know just is, that is uh, a part of reality, it's a necessity, it cannot be changed? Or is it something that somebody did it to us, that, there is a, that, that we are actually a victim of injustice? So do you have an example of an injustice that is, let's say, in your, in your country or where you come from, treated as something that cannot be changed, as something that we just have to live with, that is not a result of somebody's wrongdoing. Is there? Yeah. Hmm? So in India, they, we have caste system, mm -hmm. which is basically a hierarchy based on who's born upper caste and who's born lower mm -hmm. caste. And for a long time, people thought that this is our fate. And we, because we are born in a certain way, 
it should not be changed. Whereas they don't realize that it's actually a system of injustice mm -hmm. created by on religious grounds to put some people down and to maintain the hierarchy. Exactly. Very good, very good example. So for thousands of years, people just accepted it as, you know, the way things are. You know, and so it was a big moment where hardship produces grievances, where you say, it shouldn't be like this. It can be different, you know, we can, we can live different lives. You know, something, somebody did, it to, did this to us. It's not something that just happened, you know. Any other example? I'll give the example of uh, Balochistan, and India knows about that. It's uh, the Pakistan's largest province geographically. It produces gas and it is a rich province in uh, natural resources. But the other countries, the other provinces of Pakistan have gas. And the gas pipelines go from this province to other provinces. But many districts in the province doesn't have access to gas. So nowadays there is an insurgency also. They, write, uh, they fight for their rights and they uh, want to be separated from the country because they say that our resources are being exploited mm -hmm. by the federal government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is uh, another good example. So it's not just that there is a problem, there is somebody causing the problem. So there is an opponent. When you have hardship like top of that hill, who is the opponent? There's no opponent, you know. It's just like hard life, what can we do about it? But in this case, there is an opponent city administration, maybe. Maybe, you know, it's the system that, you know, that prevented us from having access to, to, to a service that everybody else has. So, so a, an opponent is another, is another thing. So when we look at this proto-movement, the movement that is about to emerge, so it's not yet even emerging, the first step is articulating grievances. So somebody is responsible for this hardship. Somebody is responsible. It's not actually a hardship. It's an injustice. And we should be actually angry about it. We should have grievances about it. But that is not enough. Because you can have grievances, but it doesn't mean that this will naturally lead to resistance. So what is the first step when you are faced with an injustice in, like, let's say, you know, everyday life? Let's say you were wronged uh, and you want to seek justice. What, where, where do you go first? Court. Hmm? Court, right. Any other? Uh, yeah, maybe the constitution. Yes. So you're, you're, you're trying first to address this through the institutional system. You know, so this is the, 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 first, the first step usually people take. They realize there is an injustice, but they still think, okay, the system is going to help me deal with this injustice. I just need to report it, and I just, I just need to go all the way through. But sometimes that doesn't work, because sometimes institutions are rigged, and sometimes institutions are the ones that are unjust. And so somebody realizes that later, somebody realizes it earlier, but sometimes you won't achieve justice through the institutions. So what do people do then when the institutions are not working, when the institutions are not uh, answering uh, the calls for justice and when they're not delivering? What, what do people do? They refer to the people. Mm -hmm. They refer to the people. Yes. Yes. And so they were trying to organize people to resist against those institutions. That, not, that, that doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes people try to go around the institutions. So if the institution doesn't work, you try to find a way around. So, you know, this gave us all these magnificent uh, discoveries of the human civilization, like the black market, you know, like, okay, you, who, who lives in a country where the uh, hard currency cannot be attained uh, legally? Yeah. That's another example. Yeah. yeah. We have a strict currency control. Okay. Dollars. Okay. So where do you go? You go to the black market. So you go around the institution. But the institution is still there. So 
un understanding the institutions doesn't work still doesn't produce re this resistance by default because sometimes people just try to go around. I mean, the whole, you know, there is an argument that the whole invention of corruption is actually trying to find the court shortcuts inside the institutions. And then it started like people were trying to, you know, get a service that they cannot get. And so they would bribe somebody. And then the system itself understood that it can actually make money uh, out of that. So it incorporated corruption as a part of the system. So it co-opted the, the, the practice. So going around the institutions sometimes works individually, but rarely changes the status quo. It can actually, uh, the, the, the system can perpetuate it. And then, what you, what you mentioned is going against the institutions, organizing people to go against the institutions. And sometimes going against institutions means pressuring these institutions to change their behavior. So petition drives are an example of that. Protests, demonstrations, different ways of pressuring institutions to, to change their behavior. Hmm? Press, news media, yeah. Some, sometimes institutions don't change their behavior even after that. So what people do is they build parallel institutions. And they try to solve their problems that are a result of institutional failure through building parallel institutions. So as Hardy said in, his previous, in the previous presentation, Uh, extra institutional element is key to uh, civil resistance. So even if there is a part of civil resistance that is going on inside of the institutions, it still has the goal to pressure these institutions or to replace them. So it's not really institutional. It's just using that channel, but for a different, for a different goal. And this anti-institutional uh, element of civil resistance is, is very important. So we started from, you know, hardship, and we, we started, you know, understand, people understanding and articulating their grievances, going through the institutions. The institutions don't respond. They go against the institutions. They decide to, to organize against the institutions. And then there is another decision that is often being made before the movement is formed, and that is what is the method of the struggle? And in some struggles, as we will see from uh, research done by Erika and, 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 and Maria, it's happening less than, let's say, 40, 50 years ago, but it's still happening. People decide that the extra institutional struggle is going to be a violent one. But in some cases, they decide, and these cases are more numerous recently, that this struggle is going to be a nonviolent one. So, as you see, there are lots of decisions that need to be made before we, have a, before we have a movement. First, we have to articulate our grievances. Then we have to understand the method of the struggle that needs to be extra-institutional, and not just around the institutions, but actually against the institutions. And then we have to actually uh, decide that this method is going to be nonviolent. And we're going to talk more about it, why nonviolent method, when we talk about movement strategy, and when we talk about repression and backfire and uh, all the other elements of it, so I won't go into that now. So, okay, we articulated all that. Grievances, we know who is the problem and what is the problem and how we're going to solve it. So what we have now is the struggle. And this struggle, in some cases, lasts for a couple of years. In some cases, it can last for decades. Look at the struggle in South Africa against apartheid. It lasted for decades. Look at the struggle of the American blacks for their rights. It lasted for decades. I mean, if you, if you connect it to the 19th century struggle against uh, slavery, you can say it's a century or a couple of centuries old struggle, and it's still continuing. So the struggle itself can be a very long one. It can be multi-generational. One generation will start it, the other one will continue it, and maybe the third or the fourth generation will bring it to an end. So the struggle is the big fight for the, for the, against the injustice that we're talking about. And so if we look at this struggle, we will see certain 
moments of really big mobilization happening. And this is where people articulate their grievances into demands. So they're like, we don't want to tolerate this anymore. This is, the, this is uh, what we want to see ended, or this is uh, the change in the system that we want to see. And there is, there is a, these are moments of great mobilization that are happening. And these are often noticed by the media. So these are the protests. These are like big mobilizations, usually in the street, where people are getting together. They go, f you know, flood the streets, and, and, and everybody is aware that something is going on. So we see these moments every now and then. But the struggle is going on in between, and we usually don't see it. And so this is the most interesting part, the one that we don't see. So what we have in these moments in between is some sort of organizing. So what we have is movements appearing, uh, running for a while, maybe bringing a, 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 a struggle to an end, to a victory, but sometimes they don't. And, uh, the struggle continues. There is a movement failure, but that's not the end of the world. Because what usually happens is that a few years later, or you know, at some point, a new movement emerges and, and carries on the struggle, changes it uh, a little bit. But as long as there is an underlying cause, an underlying injustice, the struggle will go on, and the movements will be born. So what we're going to look at is these movements that, that appear. What is, the big problem is that it's actually very difficult to spot a movement, especially in its forming phase. And uh, we, as we look from the outside, of if, or if we look from the, from like uh, after the fact, after everything was over, we will see protests. And they're very clear to see, but the movements will be difficult to see. We also can see organizations because they have a date when they were formed and they have a date when they, you know, cease to exist or whatever. So we can, we can pretty much track their lifespan. But with movements, it's a bit more fluid because movements are all about organizing outside of the structure. There is a structure, but also people are organizing outside of the structure. And it's actually very interesting uh, to look at like when movements actually formed and uh, Sometimes that formation lasts for, for months before it's officially, let's say, launched. What we can more easily see is the campaigns that these movements run. So this is easier because a campaign is a public outreach. So there is like a product that we can look at. There are slogans, there are campaign messages, there are tactics that are done. So we can see campaigns that these movements do. And so what is interesting to see is what is the relation between these campaigns that these movements do, the efforts to mobilize people, and the protests that happen. And are the protests that happen much more successful? Or let's say, are they, uh, if they're a result of, of like a sustained organized effort like a campaign or not? So we have a struggle. We have points in time which we can monitor. These are. These are uh, protests and uh, mo moments of mass mobilization. We have campaigns that we can also monitor in time, and we can spot them. And we have movements. And this is what we are interested in. We want to see the movement. We want to find the movement. So let me give you an example. So this is Kuchma uh, uh, versus Ukrainian people, let's say, <laughs> case number one. So Kuchma comes to power 1994. And, you know, he's challenged institutionally, but there is no big mobilization uh, happening until the murder of uh, Gongadze, the journalist, and then the, some tapes leaked, which actually connected Kuchma to the murder. And the, 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 the journalist was uh, monstrously murdered. His head was chopped off. So, and when these tapes leaked, there was a huge mobilization in 2001. And this was called the Ukraine without Kuchma movement. And it's this picture here from those demonstrations. So huge uh, mobilization, but they didn't succeed in, in, 
in deposing Kuchma. Kuchma sends in the police, they crack down, the protests fizzle out. And so if you look at it in like mid-2001, you say, okay, this didn't work out. But what happened is that at this particular protest, a lot of people get, got the chance to meet for the first time. It was a large gathering of people. So they met for the first time. Some of them were never in politics before. They weren't part of traditional opposition, political parties or whatever, organizations. So they met for the first time in the street. They felt this. Oops, I just removed my. Sorry about that. So they felt this moment of great mobilization and energy for the first time. And they said, oh, we want to have more of that. So what, they, what happened in the next uh, couple of years is a number of organizations were formed. Pora is, is one of them. It's a student uh, organization, student movement in, in, in Ukraine, 2003 and 2004. And this organizing and the campaigns they did in 2003 and 2004 can actually point us to the next mass mobilization, even bigger. This is the Orange Revolution of 2004, where Kuchma's favorite candidate of those elections, Yanukovych, was forced to accept the defeat after he tried to steal elections. So we have a protest, followed by a mobilization. So this is the movement. And then we have another protest that is the result of that. So protest slowly turned into a movement here. Next example, Egypt and Mubarak. Mubarak. He ruled Egypt for 30 years. And there was no real big mobilization against Mubarak in the streets. There was an opposition to Mubarak, mostly by the Muslim Brotherhood, which were trying to build their own parallel uh, political system. But in 2005, Kifaya organized a series of street manifestations and demonstrations that challenged Mubarak. And it was big because it was, there was no such thing happening like that in the 80s or in the 90s. So it was big. But it fizzled out. They didn't succeed. But what happened is some people, now you're going to hear the same story all over again, some people met for the first time, and this was the, their first exposure to this kind of political activism. And so they became friends with other people like that, and they were thinking, how can we do it again? So in the next couple of years, they started organizing and making different kinds of organizations, and these organizations came together, and that was the 2011 uh, uprising and, uh, and revolution, 26th of January. So we have the same thing. We have a protest, and we have a movement, and then it leads to another protest. But this other protest is a result of uh, movement activity. Our third example, my own. So we had like a number of protests against Milosevic. This is in 1991, first one. Uh, Milosevic is in power since 87. And so in 91, first big uh, challenge to Milosevic, he sends in the tanks, cracks down, everybody is you know, dispersed, nothing happens. Next year, <laughs> 1992, you know, I was still in high school. So again, a new protest, you know, nothing happens, fizzles out, whatever. Next protest, 1996, this is the first time I actually got involved and I wasn't really interested in politics. I was thinking, how will I finish my uh, university, get a mechanical engineering degree and move to uh, US or Canada. That was what I was thinking about. But I was <laughs> caught in the whole whirlwind that, 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 that appeared and everybody was like organizing and I was like, yeah, I have to be part of this. So I became part of that. And I was never involved in any politics before. And so other people who I met then. And we all met, and we had a great time, and we felt the energy, we held the power, and we felt the, the potential of this protest, but the protest fizzled out. And Milosevic survived the 1996 protest. But what happened is that it was followed by very serious organizing following the, following the protest. Okay, first year, 1997, we were all depressed that it didn't work out. But in 1998, we were thinking, ah, can we try it again? What, what, what can we change so that, you know, it doesn't fizzle out again? So we have another story 
The same like in, in Ukraine and in Egypt, the transformation from a protest to a movement. So what these stories have in common? What are the characteristics of this transition that is happening? And this is some sort of an epiphany that people who participate in protests have. They had an experience of a protest. They saw the potential, but they saw its limitations. And they're sitting there and thinking, how can we do this better? And this is how mo movements are born. First is the change from reaction to action. Protests are usually a reaction. Something happens, you know, Gongadze is killed, we go and protest because this is, this is outrageous. Or Mubarak wants to change the constitution, you know, to allow his son to become uh, a president after him. That's outrageous, we go and protest. Milosevic uh, falsifies elections, we are outraged, we go out and protest. So this is a reaction. But what movements do is they move from reaction to action. They actually uh, think how they can initiate events, not just react to them. Another thing is, yes, we articulated grievances in our proto-movement, and we know what we don't want, but there is another transformation that needs to happen. That is from grievances to intent. So what are we going to do about it? What is the... A particular course of action that we're going to take to address these grievances. Not to wait for the government to do it. We're not going to uh, uh, go down that road. We understand the, the institutional traps. We are going to do it. So we are going to, uh, to get organized. We are going to be the ones who are going to change it. But that's, that intent needs to be stated. And people have to understand that it's not just enough to, to have complaints, but actually to to have a plan what to do about that. Another thing is the move from demands to goals. So when people protest, they usually have demands, like, ah, oh, we want this to stop. So we are going to protest till the day the government stops its behavior. So you make the move, and then you wait for the opponent, for the government, to make another move, to say, sorry, we're not going to do it again. So this is a classic uh, dynamics of a protest. You know, we all know about protests that have demands. But what movements have is not demands, they have goals. They set what they want to achieve and they work to achieve that. It's not just protesting and waiting for the government to, to do something or for the other side, but actually understanding how are we going to reach our goal? What are the steps that we need to make? But we first need to figure out what the goal is. And then the final one, and we're going to talk about it more tomorrow, is the shift from tactics to strategy. And that is shifting from thinking like, OK, this is, uh, this is bad. We have to do something about it. What is a tactic we can do about it? You know, this company is behaving badly. What are we going to do? What is the tactic? We're going to boycott their product. You know, this government official is, you know, a crook. What are we going to do about it? Are we going to do a petition to... Uh, petition uh, for his resignation. So it's a tactical thinking. And what movements do is actually strategic thinking. It's thinking about steps, thinking about like what are the steps that we need to take in the next two years, three years to reach that goal. In the case of this company, who are the connected entities to this company? How can we disconnect these entities from that company? For in the case of a politician, what is his power base? How, how can we actually win the constituents on our side against this politician? So it's a different kind of thinking. It's not one step, it's a multi-step thing. And so the final, the final point I have to make is that when we look at movements, you know, we will see different, different examples in this uh, framework that, that I described, the struggle, the movement, the, the different kind of protests and, and campaigns. So there will be a formal one and an informal one. So in some cases, we will see an organization and the movement forming around that organization. So this is the first example. So we have an, a, an organization which is relatively formal, but we see that like people who shouldn't be part of that organization are part of that organization. This organization actually 
is some sort of a movement. So example of that is uh, Polish solidarity. So 10 million Poles, right? Is that the number of the members of solidarity? So 10 million Poles officially joined solidarity, which was a trade union. So that means that one in three uh, working age Poles were members of the solidarity trade union. Of course, they were not there as members of the trade union. It was something else. They were members of the movement. It's just that officially that movement was formed around the structure that Solidarity as a trade union created. So it's organizing outside of the structure. There is a structure, but you don't need to be a member or like officially to be part of that, uh, how should I say, structure. You can organize around it and, and outside it. In some cases, there is a coalition, very strict coalition, let's say uh, Union of Democratic Forces in South Africa in the 80s. A coalition of organizations and then, you know, there is a movement around it. So not all people actually when they join the movement against apartheid, which was led by the UDF and by ANC for, for decades before that, they didn't need to join the, the actual organization. They are going to join the activities. So they're joining the movement. And in most cases, like in this one, it's a mess. You have some organizations that are publicly endorsing the movement. In some organizations, half of the organization's members joined the movement. The other half didn't join. It's a, it's, it's a mess. But what is also important is that there, is, there are certain structures that are being utilized for the movement. Let's say this structure and this structure. And then there is also organizing that is happening outside of the structure. And what is important about movements is that movements is, are not about supporting. It's not something that you say, yeah, I, we agree with what this movement is doing and we are you know, totally in line with them. The movements are actually about uh, joining and about action. And so what we see in these cases is, and uh, I think that uh, the research that, that, that Eric and Maria did shows that really well, is that participation is the key to success. That means people who are actively joining the movement is actually they're changing their behavior through acts of commission and omission, and this is what the, what the movement really is. And this is why it's so difficult to see it, because it's happening outside of the structures that, that we can much more easily spot. So we can see its manifestations, the protests and mass mobilizations that happen. We can see the more structured way of, of, of organizing, which, are, which is through campaigns. But the movements, we can't really see. So we have to look at this participation, individual behavior of people that are joining the movement without officially joining any of the organizations that are part of it. So this is the, 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 the framework that I laid out. And now I'll turn to Maciej and uh, he's going to talk more about the mechanisms of, 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 of people's activation when movements emerge. Much. Thank you. I want to take the, uh, yeah. this fell off. Yeah. I'm going to take this on. Do it. Give us a second. I can, I'll go for this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hold on a minute. Okay. I think. Oh, just give us two seconds. I was getting a little fuzzy noise there. Okay. Hold on, let me just get it. One, two, one, two. Okay, great. Uh, ready for more? Uh, okay, so I, as Ivan said, I will try to get into the mechanism how people are uh, joining the movement and, and creating kind of revolutionary um, 
type of uh, resistance um, and uh, focusing on a couple of elements that I think are important to understand that. And of course, there are a number of writers, probably as many as there were revolutions, uh, who were trying to explain why revolutionary movements happened. One of them uh, was a Polish journalist and writer, Richard Kapuściński, who between 1950s and 80s, he probably wrote uh, um, essays and, and uh, uh, novels about more than 20 revolutions. And one of them that he was fascinated was the revolution in Iran in, in 78. And he was trying to explain in his book, uh, The Shah of Shahs, um, the fall of the uh, uh, Pahlavi regime. And uh, in one moment, he's trying really to get into the essence of, you know, how come, you know, people um, rise up against um, oppression, despite the fact that there is so much uncertainty and also so much cost involved in resistance. And he, f he focused on this issue of man gets rid of fear and feels free. This is the moment where this revolutionary event occurs, and that's where the, the, the people rise up. Now, it's interesting the extent to which um, um, academics or people who are not academics are focusing on the issue of emotions, like fear. Whereas in the, uh, in the scholarship, in, in the scholarly world, you will not find much, actually, scholarship in terms of emotions and, and the rise of resistance, or emotions and the rise of movements, civil, uh, civil resistance movements. And I wanted, to, I wanted to come back eventually together with Ivan in a kind of exercise on emotions to bring this much more to the for forefront of the analysis about the rise of civil resistance movements. Um, and uh, it's difficult to predict the occurrence that um, uh, Ivan described so uh, nicely in terms of the rise of the uh, movements, uh, simply because there are certain dilemmas that people are facing when they try, when they try to join uh, civil resistance. And uh, they are on a very basic level. Of course, we don't know the level of these grievances. Uh, we cannot really conduct an open opinion polls about what we think if we are struggling in a very restrictive environment, restrictive space. Uh, then even if we know from our friends, from family, how others are feeling, we don't know whether, whether we, if we organize something, people will indeed come and will join us in resistance action. And then also, once that resistance happens, we, we don't know whether we will be successful. So there is a lot of kind of uncertainty and dilemmas that uh, people face uh, when they try to form um, the movement. And uh, so then, of course, how the resistance is possible. And it's interesting that um, in the conversation about um, revolutionary kind of movements, um, we have, and then eventual revolution and, and the collapse of the regimes, we've got two things. Either that revolutions are not possible or that revolutions are inevitable. Nothing in between. And uh, in my view, this kind of dichotomy comes uh, precisely because we are focusing more on the durability or focusing more on the institutions and structures rather than on the, on the people. So when we, when we talk about um, that revolutions is not possible, that civil resistance movements are not possible to emerge, we oftentimes would say that uh, or focus on the durability of the structures. Why scholars missed Arab Spring was precisely because they focused on the durability of the authoritarian regimes. They were writing about how those structures are able to sustain themselves for so long. They didn't imagine that the change would happen or that that change would come from the bottom up. They would say, okay, those structures may be able to change, but that change would come from top down. If those, it, it would be struggle between elites, between power holders. That's when the change is possible. But otherwise, those structures are very durable. And then, of course, those structures collapse. And then suddenly they discovered, well, actually, you know, the, the regime was uh, um, uh, irremovable, seemed irremovable, but when it collapsed, its collapse became inevitable because of certain, um, um, certain elements within that regime that made it weak. So the regime were, they didn't have enough capacity to repress. They, um, there was internal power struggle. But they talked about those things as if the activists that kind of rise up against those structures knew about them. So oftentimes we see analysis of the revolution, which was done by also Tocqueville when he wrote about French Revolution. Uh, when people are analyzing the reasons for the 
for the collapse of the system, they would say that you know, the system was already weak. And, uh, and that's why it collapsed. Um, and I remember writings about uh, the communist system in the 1970s. There was a number of writings that said, a communist system is actually weak internally. Its economy is becoming uh, weaker. Uh, there are some power struggles. Um, there is also pressure from the West. So its demise is inevitable. But it took 20 years before that became a really a reality. And it actually didn't be, and it, that didn't become a reality because it's the, the, the collapse was inevitable, but because people organized themselves in mass resistance actions between 1970 and 1980 and weakened that system and brought it down. So um, we oftentimes look at the events that happen uh, with, uh, with the knowledge that we have today. So we know that there was a power struggle between Mubarak and the army, and the army then defected. But uh, the activists may not necessarily know that when they actually rise up against Mubarak. They may have seen the regime as being quite strong. And actually the repression that came from the regime might have indicated at least that time on January 27, 28, that the regime is quite powerful. So um, we oftentimes are falling into this trap of trying to understand the rise of movements and eventual what those movements brought about by um, using the knowledge that we have um, about those events uh, that um, those knowledge kind of came about later because we start analyzing the system. We saw eventually those divisions, but those divisions were not really um, present there or very visible to the activists themselves. Can you explain the picture? Yes, so uh, someone is from, uh, so we have um, Mosin, you are from, um, where is Mosin? Yes. You are from South Sudan. Yes. Um, it was in Sudan, in South Sudan, but maybe you know that picture. It's what? This is like Sierra Leone. It was also in Sierra Leone? It was, done, it was a protest called Lick the Elbow. Now, that's, that's, that's the actually, that's the um, 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 symbolism of what is possible, what is not possible. Try to lick your elbow. Is it possible? It looks impossible. <laughs> what I know is the President Omar al-Bashir, who once had the famous line saying that overthrowing him would be as impossible as licking your own elbow. So in a gesture of defiance, the protesters went out and started licking their elbows and see if they could do it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, and that, that's how the you know, inevitability of revolution um, kind of uh, comes about. Um, and um, <clears throat> so that's the, that's the picture. Um, and of course, um, we oftentimes uh, see how difficult it is to uh, predict and see the, this revolutionary movement coming simply because there is so much focus on trying to understand how the structures and institutions work rather than how the people are organizing. And the best example comes from uh, uh, analysis that uh, were published uh, between um, after the Ben Ali departure to Tunisia, but revolution in Egypt hasn't yet happened. And then there was like a 10-day window. It was January 15, January 25th, uh, 2011. And there was a lot of writings uh, coming from established uh, um, um, analysts, analysts and, and media saying that, uh, well, the revolution in Egypt is not possible. Okay, if it's possible, uh, it would not be so short like in Tunisia. And then even if it's possible and could be shorter, it won't be successful. And then they were producing those different arguments that really focus on um, kind of uh, elements that were part of the structures or institutions. So they were saying that you know, Egypt in terms of polarization, there's much greater polarization in Egypt between Christians and Muslims, like in, Tur like in Tunisia. So that would be more difficult to really, um, uh, for the movement to emerge. Um, nature of the regime, in Tunisia it was a police regime, in, the, in Egypt, it's a military regime. Mubarak is coming from the military. He will maintain the loyalty of the military in contrast to Ben Ali that he could, uh, who couldn't. Um, then Tunisians were generally had better economic kind of um, situation. So by then, they were ready to demand political rights instead of just economic rights. Um, there was kind of a larger middle class. That wasn't the case in Egypt. Egyptians were still struggling economically. They were fighting for economic rights more than thinking about the political rights. And uh, greater access to internet, um, um, more Tunisians on Facebook, easier to organize then, 
then that was in case in Egypt. And in Egypt, there was a pharaoh com com complex. So even um, there was one um, um, uh, scholar who was saying that Egyptians are ready to accept, if I only pronounce that correctly, gumluka, which is uh, the combination of, of monarchy and republic. So they were gumluka? Gumulikia. Uh, so in other words, uh, they, were able, they, they, were, they could even accept hereditary republic. The things in kind of in contradiction. So they would accept that Gamma will become a president uh, simply because they had this pharaoh complex and uh, pharaoh was also, pharaonic rules was also hereditary. So that wasn't present, of course, in Tunisia, and Tunisians were much more ready to rebel against uh, any uh, uh, possibility of uh, Ben Ali nominating one of his family members to, um, to take over from him. And then, catalytic event, uh, we had Mohammed Bouazizi self emulation that rise the uh, uh, Tunisians uh, and uh, uh, and those kind of catalytic event wasn't visible in in Egypt. There was the burning of the Coptic Church at the beginning of January 2011 that didn't really lead uh, to, to to revolution. So there was uh, what essentially those analyses missed. Um, they missed the focus on what ordinary people were doing. Uh, they uh, missed uh, how actual activists learned, uh, starting from 2000 in terms of organizing what they did. Uh, uh, they, uh, they, they really didn't focus on how activists were, were able to um, learn from their failures in order to succeed in, in, in other contexts. Uh, they uh, didn't really focus on how people overcome the fear and how repression could have backfired. And if we look at this revolutionary tide in Egypt, and Ivan presented that this is more kind of detailed picture, we really would need to go to, to 2000 to understand how Egyptians started organizing themselves. And where exactly, what was the moment when it was visible that Egyptians are no longer afraid to rise up? Uh, there was a lot of tactical learning. Just to give you an example, in anti-war protests in 2003, this was for the first time when Egyptians occupied um, uh, the Tahrir Square. And uh, uh, Basma can, can say probably more on that. But, it was that time when, the, um, after a couple of days of occupying the Tahrir Square, Egyptians decided to go home. They said, okay, we kind of managed to occupy, to show our strength, we'll go home. And within the next couple of weeks, they were picked up by security forces, around uh, thousands of activists. We were in prison for a couple of uh, days and weeks. Uh, and uh, from that experience, they told themselves that if we, if we ever occupy Tahrir Square again, we will never leave it until our demands are fully met. And that was one of important lessons that already activists learned in 2003. Another thing which was in 2010, when El Baradai came back and started collecting signatures, this was for the first time I think it was visible that Egyptians were no longer afraid. When he was collecting those signatures, they were asking people to sign up with the ID numbers uh, under the petition for political change. And Egyptians did that. And that was quite a telling um, thing. So that showed also that the Egyptians were no longer really afraid of the, of the system. Um, and certainly, no one was looking into this kind of learning curve and what was happening within, within the Egyptian society psyche uh, because of those uh, activists, both from the young protesters to labor organizing um, to um, just ordinary people protesting against police brutality. Um, so we went through that. There is a, um, why oftentimes we are missing the important uh, changes within the, the agency of people is because we are focusing on political power that is really top-down, <coughs> material and physical. And Forbes, if you are ever interested in, in knowing according to Forbes who is the most powerful person on earth, um, they've got very kind of top-down and material-based um, analysis uh, of ranking of 70 people, 72 people that are most powerful according to Forbes. Um, on earth, and that's the people that we should really care about. And uh, the other five billion people are not really important. Um, so that's the understanding, that is common understanding of political power in media. Uh, and of course, we, we know quite well that there is another political power that is visible only when we see those millions of people on the streets. But as, as um, uh, Ivan was saying, that this political power uh, might be reflected in different types of organizing. And I will touch on, on this in a moment. So uh, uh, movements and, and civil resistance movements are 
occurring, and this is kind of based on the kind of case studies um, uh, that are included in, in my edited volume. They occurred under different geographies, under different cultures, under um, different political systems. And uh, interesting enough, there were a number of civil resistance movements and civil resistance campaigns that actually occurred even before the Gandhi. Uh, um, even before we know about the practice that, that came, the strategic practice of civil resistance that, that came from, from Gandhi. So um, movements are not limited to any type of kind of environment. They occur in, a, in, a, in different contexts. And uh, this comes from Erika's book in terms of um, where the nonviolent and violent campaigns occurred between 1900 and 2006 is have more cases than in my book, of course, and uh, and they are um, um, essentially what these figures are showing. That uh, interestingly or counterintuitively, um, that uh, civil resistance movements are oftentimes occurring much more than actually uh, violent campaigns in strong states, uh, in uh, you know, most powerful states. Uh, so um, in, in states that would be quite centralized, and we talk about perhaps states like Russia, Iran, whereas they would be less uh, likely to occur in states like Afghanistan, maybe uh, Somalia, where these powers, where you don't have a strong state structures. Um, would anyone try to guess why that might be the case? Why we would see the rise of resistance in more in stronger uh, states where one would probably expect e even you know, more effective repression? There's, there's, a, there's an institution you can address your grievances at in the strong, stronger states. Yes, oftentimes, uh, yes, indeed. Oftentimes you would see quite clearly who is your adversary. Uh, in a more kind of fragmented states, or for that matter, decentralized states, it's difficult to kind of go um, uh, and identify that this is the specific um, institution or a specific person that is responsible for my grievance. And if I, if I pressure that person or that institution, my grievances will be effectively addressed. Uh, and um, uh, there is another study uh, done by Freedom House uh, in 2005 where the authors looked at uh, 37, 37 different um, countries within which uh, nonviolent movements emerged. And they look whether uh, um, such things like regime type, like economic development, like ethnic and religious polarization, whether it had impact on the possibility or probability of emergence of nonviolent movements. And they didn't find um, correlation, significant correlation. In other words, whether the regime was a single party or militaristic regime or, uh, or kind of personalistic dictatorship, uh, the probability of emergence of nonviolent movements was the same. Uh, and uh, similarly for economic development, whether the countries were poorer or richer, whether the countries had uh, higher or lower illiteracy rates of the population, the probability of emergence of nonviolent movements were, uh, was the same. Uh, the only thing that really they found correlating with um, the emergence of the movement, uh, either higher or lower probability for the emergence of the movement, was decentralization. So if the countries were more decentralized, it was less uh, likely that the nonviolent movement would emerge. And if the countries were centralized, it was more likely for the civil resistance to emerge. And the argument was that it was much easier to identify the adversary. Now, if there was a dictator reading that study, um, the advice that, that uh, he would get from that study would be, decentralize your, your government. Well, that goes against you know, how the dictators are ruled. So, but that would be essentially advice to the dictators in order to decrease the likelihood of the emergence of civil resistance movements against them. Um, so there are different theories, and I will not go into that. It's not much time uh, around um, uh, trying to explain why people um, would resist, why movements would, um, would emerge. Uh, and um, even touch about this issue of deprivation, you know, if you can compare yourself to others, this might be the, um, when you see that, uh, you know, your grievances are justified because others have this, uh, they, 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 they live in the high, uh, high scraper and you are living in this small town, small, small house, then uh, this would increase the probability of, of you um, resisting. Um, 
sometimes you think that you would gain materially from being part of the of the movement uh, in terms of you live in such deprivation that any type of change would be beneficial. Um, um, sometimes there would be the opportunities. That would be the, the people who would study the structures, the structures of the government, that, they are, that the government is no longer able to effectively repress people, and that opens opportunities for organizing. Um, some others would think that um, uh, resistance might be very um, focused in terms of the place they, it's emerging. Um, they would point uh, to um, student campuses as the places where the resistance would, would, be, uh, would be intensive. Um, in Birma, for example, uh, Birmese uh, generals decided to move campuses outside of the cities to rural areas to decrease the possibility of the movement of the emergence of the movement and, and resistance. Uh, and uh, diffusion uh, across borders, was, you know, Arab Spring was, was an example. Um, the kind of Egyptians felt quite jealous about what Tunisians did uh, and rise up. Catalytic events, uh, um, self-immolation of, of uh, Mohammed Bouazizi. But we know that also there were a number of self-immolations actually prior to Mohammed Bouazizi in Tunisia that didn't lead to revolution necessary. And also in such countries like Morocco, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, and that didn't kind of rise to rev revolutionary tide. And um, resource mobilization, so um, some theorists would say that uh, the movements are likely to emerge when there are pre-existing resources available for them in terms of networks, in terms of um, kind of knowledge, experience, uh, uh, in terms of kind of organizational base. And finally, um, I came across of the analysis of the Russian Revolution in 2011, or Russian White Revolution, the protest that happened after the rigged uh, parliamentary elections. And there was one scientist that was saying that I noticed actually the um, solar system being much more active at uh, that time when the protests happened. <laughs> So he called that sun, sunspot revolution. And he analyzed the activity of the sun to predict the emergence of the movement. Um, so you got different you know, analysis of that. But I really wanted to focus on, on uh, three things very quickly. It's the self-identification as an important part, what I would call cognitive um, awakening of the, for the creation of the movement, strategic and tactical pivots of resistance, so the, the issue how uh, people are planning the resistance, which is important for the emergence of the movement, and then activizing emotions, which would be our exercise. So very quickly, um, what we, uh, when I analyze nonviolent movements, what I notice oftentimes is this kind of cognitive liberation, which is on a very basic level, very simple. Uh, uh, people are seeing themselves more often than not, particularly when they are passive, as victims. And if you are a victim, then you are powerless. But then uh, some people in the discourse, in the kind of discussion about what is possible to do in this hopeless situation, they start to notice uh, one thing, that the existence of that injustice might be associated with what I do. It's not only someone that is someone who is doing the injustice, but also something that what I do or what I don't do. So suddenly there is this transition from me being a victim but also uh, being someone that is actually contributing to injustice in the way I behave, in the way I act. And, uh, uh, and this is the step really to, uh, for this awakening because if my action, uh, if I, what I do, what I don't do, is actually contributing to injustice, or to the maintenance of that injustice, perhaps if I change that behavior, I can maybe change some things that are, um, that are sustaining that injustice. So from the victim, um, um, kind of discourse, I'm entering right now the discourse of the kind of liberation and I'm becoming my own liberator. And that oftentimes when you analyze, I think, um, uh, different, what dissidents were saying, in one moment of time there was, there's always this switch from the victim to the liberator, that people are responsible themselves, it's not only that dictator that's responsible for injustice, people, what they do, what they don't do, and if the people are responsible for that, if they change their behavior, they might be their own liberators at the same time. Um, now, in terms of um, uh, uh, strategic kind of um, um, approach or, or invention that oftentimes enabled uh, movements to emerge, um, that strategy is oftentimes relied on this, on this kind of concept of playing system against itself and, uh, and dramatizing at the same time its legitimacy. And this, uh, and I will just give you one, one example which is from Poland. So of course, uh, so under the communist um, uh, regime, 
um, the workers were told that they are the leading class. They are the vanguard of the society. And, um, uh, and they were always put on the pedestal in a sense that you know, they, they were the most important social class. And then, so the workers, they were like, OK, we are the most important uh, um, uh, um, part of the society. It seems like we can do everything we want. That's what the system is telling us. So we go to the system and we ask a simple thing. If we are leaders in that society, if we are, if we are so important, um, why we don't have the right, why we don't have a simple right to self-organize? Why we don't have a right to establish free trade unions? Um, so they were essentially using um, you know, system in that sense against itself. That happened uh, partly in China when uh, um, um, President Xi Jinping uh, came with the agenda of fighting corruption and some of the um, activists uh, around New Citizens Movement, they, um, they started talking about, well, we are also against corruption. We launched campaign. And of course, that would be much more difficult um, for the regime to kind of go against them if they are, what they are doing, they are doing the same thing the regime wants them to do. It's just because they are doing that independently, they are threatening the regime, of course. Um, and then in the, um, in the US, you, um, you remember maybe from the film when John Lewis is saying that we read one thing in the Bill of Rights, uh, 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 Declaration of Independence and in Constitution, and what we saw in reality was completely different. So again, um, they were referring to what the system was telling and turning that against the, the system. And, um, and of course, sometimes the system would help in the rise of movements. Um, this is the, the example of uh, how Putin helped uh, the movement against itself or in himself. Um, he, um, he essentially was uh, branding non uh, those who joined the uh, small protest that time as being foreign agents, as being paid by, the, by foreign money. And uh, you know, because they were poor students, and of course students need money. So they, they were getting from outside sources. So suddenly, during larger protests, you had people with uh, such posters like, I'm here unpaid. Obama paid me in person. <laughs> and uh, you know, so that, that kind of completely backfired, right? And it actually increased the number of people that went out on the streets to protest. Basma. And all the people brought the Kentucky meals. Yeah, actually, we, we know from this uh, rumors, and we, we said what we are the like Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> Good, exactly. And another, um, another kind of backfire thing was about, again, Putin in terms of ignorance that inflames resistance and rises also people's mobilization. He was, um, he was referring to those people, um, the symbol of the, of the kind of. Uh, um, movement was the right, uh, white ribbon. And he was saying that actually those white ribbons, they look like condoms <laughs> that people wear. That's what he said, public in the interview. And you've, you've got that quote here. And then people started you know, making a mockery. <laughs> he should probably, you know, uh, um, there's, a, there's a proverb that if you have the ribbon on the, uh, in the mouth that you should, you should probably uh, stay silent rather than speak. Some people dress up like condoms on during the protest. <laughs> uh, and uh, you had a couple of you know, uh, things. Uh, <laughs> That increased, you know, that's stupidity. Stupidity of the system helps the resistance. It's, if only resistance can, you know, um, creatively use that. Um, but also, what helps is uh, concrete goals. Uh, the emergence of the movements would often uh, be around, um, particularly if the struggle is against something that is um, uh, very, very elusive, where the where the injustice is very pervasive and not very tangible, when the movements uh, are able to distill this very general kind of injustice into a um, uh, very concrete, specific objective. And here you've got a couple of cases. Uh, I mean, of course, in the Polish struggle was uh, free trade unions. But in the Indian independence struggle, where to start with Indian independence struggle? Well, Gandhi started from SALT. And I think during the week, we'll talk more about the SALT march. Uh, but essentially, SALT became the, the issue that mobilized Indians uh, and showing at the same time injustice of the British. In the case of the Palestine, you, know, you start from the village level resistance against the wall, but it's really part of the uh, independence struggle. So as, uh, concrete objectives of the, of the specific smaller campaigns mobilized um, movements. Uh, and uh, 
sometimes the tactical innovation uh, allows de uh, a decrease of, of the risks of repression that can also help to uh, bring more people um, to, to resist because it becomes less risky. In the case of Poland, uh, one switch from the street protests, so workers went on strikes, but they went on strikes while being on the streets and protesting. They were very much exposed to the repression of the regime, and oftentimes that repression was successful. One invention that they made changed the whole struggle. They uh, decided that instead of going on the streets, uh, they actually would stay in the factories. They would engage in occupation strike. It was much easier for the movement then to control the kind of nonviolent discipline. People knew each other in the factories. It was much more difficult for the government to infiltrate, to send agent provocateurs. Uh, and at the same time, it allowed other people to come to the gates of those factories, uh, give the food, mobilize kind of outside of those factories, pass information from the factories to the larger society. So, um, and the government was also concerned that if they use repression, uh, they may destroy machineries in the process and industry, and they will not be able to restart the industry very quickly. And uh, the economy was in shambles, so they wanted to make sure that everything will be restarted. So that's actually created a lot of dilemmas for the government and allowed a number of people actually to join um, in support of the striking workers. And because that strike lasted not only a day or two, like on, on the street, but lasted for weeks and months. Um, and uh, there are also um, small acts of resistance that may not be, be significant at the, at the moment when they are implemented, but they are kind of se uh, serve as an inspiration for others. Uh, and just one example that comes from the Polish nonviolent resistance uh, history against the, uh, the Germans in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century when, Ger when Poland was partitioned. Uh, the German uh, law was very discriminatory in, um, uh, against the Poles who wanted to uh, settle on the land. It was a land discrimination. Uh, Poles could buy the land, but they couldn't build permanent residence on that land. Now, without a house, the land is becoming useful for you. Uh, so this was to enable German settlers to come buy the land and build, essentially, and Poles couldn't do that. So there was a peasant, Polish peasant who had the land and, of course, couldn't build permanent construction on the land. So he brought the caravan, wagon. And uh, uh, before going, uh, while, while he was sleeping, in the morning he wake up, he was uh, coming out of that wagon and was moving that wagon like two or three centimeters forward. So the German uh, authorities came and I like look at the wagon and said, oh, well, that's, a, that, that's a permanent construction. You cannot have this on your land. And he says, no, no, that's not a permanent construction. It actually moves every day. <laughs> it's a mobile construction. <laughs> so then Germans, you know, scratch their heads. You know, they were quite, quite legalistic. And it's like, shoot, we have to bring you to the court. I mean, this is, uh, we, I, we don't know as, a, as a civil servants how to mm, deal with that case. So we will bring, bring, bring you to the court. So the court case was going for four years back and forth between different um, um, uh, courts. And by that time when it finished, uh, the whole press in Europe, French press, British press, also American press, were writing about that uh, uh, smart Polish peasant that was defying the German um, bureaucracy and inspiring the resistance of the Poles. Um, so that was the, you know, from very symbolic small actions. Uh, I will skip that and uh, I will go straight to the issue of the, uh, to the exercise that we wanted to have for you. Um, emotions. Um, so this is the, this is the scenario. Um, the house is on fire. A lot of people gather next to the house and watch the blazes engulfing uh, the building. Suddenly a number of teenagers appear in two windows on a higher floor in the building on fire. They scream for help. One of the middle-aged bystanders moves and runs towards the building, trying to rescue. Other people remain where they stood watching. So. The question to you would be, what motivates the person who decides to come to the rescue of the trapped teenagers? And of course, what motivates others to actually stay and remain inactive? And uh, while you'll be reflecting on those two questions, I would like you to um, look into those list of emotions and um, use them in trying to explain the motives for the people that kind of stood inactive and for that person who decided to actually run to the building to rescue people. Uh, so we will divide you into groups of uh, three people. Three, yeah. So um, um, 
How about if you uh, kind of naturally come together in group of three uh, of to, to, uh, where you sit, of the people that you know are next to you, and let's spend five minutes discussing you know those motivations of both, of the one who went to the building trying to help. Yeah, there is, uh, if there is, uh, if there are like seven people in a row, then like you can have like three and four. Yeah, yeah, and the the person who who stayed, why you are looking into those uh, listed emotions. <laughs> 